The kindest fate I offer is to unify and spend eternity with a child of mine! Cryptids, mythic, a fantasy, and sci fi. We are everything monster. Welcome back to the caves. Monsterites, today I'll be unveiling the mysteries of one of the greatest of female monsters to ever stalk our imaginations. A deity and the horrendous mother of, but not before I thank our wonderful supporters at Patreon. You monsterites really help this happen, and I totally appreciate you for it. Thank you. Now, let's talk about the awe inspiring. Okay. Echidna came into existence. Wait, 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 hold on. Wrong Echidna. We're not talking about the anteater, although what a wonderful little creature it is. Oh, I need to find a new editor. You heard me. Often described as part human, part snake, as so it would best suit, considering Greek Hidna translates to viper and thus that which has come to be known as she-viper. Looking back over her found most ancient of depictions, which there aren't really many of, nor are they so ancient, we find a recurring theme of the torso and head remaining as female human, with the rest of the body being either that of a snake's or fish's with a single formation or that of two. But there's one more feature that often clearly distinguishes her from the Gorgons or Naga of the East. Wings, and well even legs and fins at times. We cannot easily place her in a box. She was, after all, one of the first. Or was she? Echidna's origins varied by storyteller, which by now have been obscured by the ages. The oldest known mentioning was within that of Hesiod's Theogony, circa 700 to 600 BCE which we've delved into recently when exploring the Cyclopes. Here Hesiod phrased that Echidna was born to a she. Who the she was remains unclear, but is speculated to be Kita, a primordial sea goddess, daughter of Gaia, Mother Earth herself. This would imply Farkis was the father. And interesting enough, they were the couple who brought forth the Gorgon sisters as well. This telling was repeated again a couple centuries later by historian Phetasides, but without a revealed mother. Another interpretation flipped this theory on its head, claiming Echidna to not only be a different generation than Gorgon Medusa, but in fact her son Chrysor's daughter. Other possible parents that came into the mix by various authors were Styx, goddess of the great river that divided Earth from the underworld, the couple Tartarus and Gaia, who were among the first three primeval deities, and Phanes, god of new life creation. Whoever the parent or parents were, the puzzling genealogy of Echidnas explains why various retellings and movies of ancient Greek tales don't match up or openly create new branches to fit the lore. Personally, I usually prefer sticking with the eldest, although that can depend on just how ridiculous it may be and whether it's a good ridiculous or bad. Henceforth, we'll take Hesiod's words of her depiction. Echidna, a fierce flesh-eating monster with speckled skin, neither human nor goddess, yet never aging. Released upon imagination, the description suggests that her head may have been monstrous or of a snake's, which collaborates better with the idea of her eating her victims. Later, the Orphic religion was found to conclude the description with her having the body of a serpent and only the head of a beautiful woman, which could very well also have been what Hesiod envisioned as he spoke of her fair cheeks. I don't recall anyone ever bringing up a snake's cheeks to me or in a video. Human or viper-headed, either could have been the case, as well as her having many snake heads such as Typhon had, or even having the addition of the animal's head at the end of the serpentine lower end of her body. Obviously, artists took liberties on their expressions of the goddess monster, and who wouldn't, when these ancient descriptions were presented with such ambiguity. Further adding to the confusion, Echidna sometimes took place of Python, which was a giant serpent at times represented as a dragon, which may help explain why she was also portrayed with legs and wings, 
The exchanges between reptilian to fish counterparts were probably also due to the lack of knowledge most people had at the time about how different these creatures were in classification. The scaly elements of these marine animals and those of reptiles were often mixed and matched in mythology. Note also, 5th century's historian Herodotus presented what closely resembled Echidna herself, although his was a type of creature rather than a named individual. A monster known as an Echidna. Before we close on this portion of Echidna's origins and representations, I would like to once again explore whether there is any earlier entity that may have influenced the forthcoming of this grotesquely wondrous mother of so many notorious monsters. Mesopotamian deities often come up at this point exposing similarities to those of later mythologies, and this case seems to be no different. Tiamat was also known as the progenitor of monsters as well as gods in her own ancient Babylonian mythology. Being the goddess of the sea, she was also represented as a serpent, a sea serpent and a lionesque dragon later to be defeated by Marduk, patron god. Considering that trading routes did exist at the time between the two cultures, they may have therefore been responsible for pushing the influence of the older Babylonian deity onto the creativity-hungry Greeks, making it possible that Tiamat may have been Echidna's conceptual predecessor. It would surely also help in explaining those fishy anatomical features. Also, this wouldn't be the only influence Tiamat had on the future monstrosity of the seas. The Hebrew Leviathan was also described as a sea serpent and which was also destroyed by a god. In this case, the god. There is also one more deity that draws some notable parallels to Echidna, although one that may be inspired by her. Angerboda, also described as mother of monsters, was spawned in Old Norse beliefs as a Jotun, which was not quite a deity and very much not human, in a loose way similar to the unclear stance of Echidna in Greek mythology. Angerboda gave birth to three prominent monsters in Norse mythology, the wolf Benrir, Hel, the ruler of the underworld, and the world serpent Jormungandr. These connections are speculations certainly worth mentioning. After exploring more of Echidna's lore, maybe some of these ties will be strengthened. Maybe others will be cut. What monsters did Echidna actually create? Was she also struck down by an ultimate god as in the stories of the Leviathan and Tiamat? If you would like to learn more about the life of Echidna, let me know down below and maybe then you will, we will, be able to arrive at a satisfying conclusion on our ancient most origins. Monsterites, our army is growing. Slowly but surely, we have just hit another goal on Patreon. Christian, Toby, Rihanna, Rain, Dante, Tammy, Ramin, Cloud, huzzah, and a huge thank you to you. If you found Echidna fascinating, you may also be interested in learning about Loki of Norse mythology. It's an older video, but the facts remain the same. Confirm your monster love today by subscribing and becoming a monsterite. Like if you found the video worthy. And remember, you can always support the safe haven for monsters of all kinds by joining us on Patreon. I have been, and will always be, Monster Master Arthur. See you in the next one. Soon, I hope.